Well, welcome to Mount Carmel Baptist Church online edition. Appreciate you tuning in to be a part of our service here as we try to worship the Lord as best we can without being together. And it's difficult, I understand, but we're still trying to learn the Lord and grow in the Lord. Had a little bit of technical difficulties today, so there's a, not a hymns and music, and we're working on it. Bear with us. We're trying to get there. I know that you all are sitting at home wearing shorts and watching this in a recliner anyway, so I don't feel too bad about it. We'll do the best we can on this end, all right? Also, as far as you know, you can't see anything from the pulpit down, so I'm wearing shorts too, as far as you know. Well, tonight I want to look in Judges chapter 7. We looked last Sunday at the call of Gideon and how Gideon had to battle his own internal battles before he could ever fight any external battles. Well, chapter 7 tells us now about Gideon responding to that call in the midst of turmoil and battle. And I'm going to read you verse 22, and then we're going to look at the rest of the chapter and see what God has to say to us about Gideon being obedient to him. Judges chapter 7, verse 22 says, And the three hundred blew the trumpets, and the Lord said, Every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled until Bethshitta in Zareth, to the border of Abel, Meholoth, unto Tabith. Would you all pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for the chance to study your word, to listen and to learn and to grow. Help us to be more like Jesus, less like the old person we used to be. If somebody does not know you as Lord and Savior of their life, Father, I pray that this evening they would give their heart and life to Jesus Christ and be saved. Thank you for all the things you're going to do for us. Thank you for all the things you've already done for us. But above all things, thank you for Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, here is Gideon. We saw him last week hiding out in a wine press. And God calls him and calls him a mighty man of valor. Now Gideon is hiding in a wine press, threshing wheat, which is not the normal procedure. And he's doing so because he's scared and he's trying to hide from the Midianite armies. And God calls him in the midst of that a mighty man of valor. You see, God called Gideon not because Gideon was great, but because God is great. God wants to take and use each of us, not based on our own potential, but based on what God can make us into. Uh, God doesn't call us because we're gifted. God gifts us to be obedient to his calling. So Gideon has answered the call of God now in this chapter. And he is being obedient to God. He has gathered an army to go and fight the Midianites. 32,000 men strong. A pretty sizable army. And at the beginning of the chapter, God tells Gideon, that's too many men, too much army. God says that the men would get the credit instead of God. And so God does something really unheard of. Through two different phases, he begins to whittle this army down to just a few hundred men. And we take this, we catch the story there. Gideon starts with 32,000 men. But then we get to verse 3, and verse 3 says, Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. So Gideon does something that nobody's ever heard of before, as far as I know, in a battle. Just before the battle, he goes and he tells his men, if any of you are afraid, go home. <laughs> now, I've never been in a war. I never served in the military, and so I'm speaking out of turn a little bit. But my guess is that everybody that has ever gone into a battle was afraid going into that battle. Now, they may be brave despite that fear, but I suspect every person alive would be fearful going into a battle where they might lose their life. And Gideon tells these men, if any of you are afraid, go home. He had an army of 32,000 and 22,000 left. 22,000 men that left. But he still has 10,000. Still a significant army. Still sizable. And so Gideon does something very unusual. God speaks to him and says, it's still too many. I want you to work that down to a smaller number again. 
And so we see the Bible start with a drink. A drink of water out of a stream. Gideon stops the army and has them drink water from a stream. And God had told him a way to filter out those who would be sent home and those who would stay and fight. God said, anybody that bends over and sticks their face in the water, I want you to send all those men home. But if any man takes some water and cups it in his hand and lifts it to his face and drinks the water that way, keep those men. Now, I've heard people speculate that the reason that uh, God kept the ones who cupped the water and lifted it to their head and, and sent home the ones who bent over is because those who would bend over couldn't see an enemy coming, left their neck exposed, things like that. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly the reasoning for why you keep one and send the other home. All we know is God commanded Gideon, keep the ones who cup the water and lift it to their mouth. So, Gideon had an army of 32,000 and 22,000 left when he said, whoever's afraid, go home. Now he has an army of 10,000, and every one of them that bent over and stuck their face down in the water and drank that way, he sent them home. And Gideon was left with 300 men. You may have heard of the 300 Spartans before. This is Gideon and the 300. Probably never heard of Gideon and the 300. But that's what happens. 300 men remain to fight. Judges chapter 7, verse 6 says this, And the number of them that lapped, putting their hands to their mouth, were 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. So 300 left against a huge, huge army. An army like a plague of locusts. Listen to verse 12 as it describes this army. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. So here is this huge array of armies. The Midianites, the Amalekites, a, a bunch of people like grasshoppers, the Bible says. Now, around here we don't have big hordes of locusts and grasshoppers, and that's part, but in that part of the world they did. The Bible says they're like grasshoppers. This is talking about something like a plague. And there's as far as... I'll tell you what. Here's a good way somebody in East Tennessee might can relate to this. The army of the Midianites was as thick as kudzu. How's that? I mean, these people were everywhere. And now Gideon has 300 men to go up against them. A drink. And God uses that drink from a stream to whittle it down to 300. But then the Bible tells us about a dream. You read about that in verse 10. Verse 9, And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Purim thy servant down to the host. So he says, All right, I want you to go down there at night and go up to the edge of the camp of this army that's as thick as kudzu. And I, I've delivered them into your hand. And he tells Gideon, if you're afraid, you can take your servant Pura with you. Well, Gideon had already sent a bunch of men home who were afraid, but apparently they weren't the only ones because Gideon and his servant go down there. Now, Gideon was afraid, but he was still very brave and very obedient to the Lord. He goes down, even though he's afraid, he obeys the Lord. He goes ahead and listens to God. He goes down there to the edge of this camp. Gideon was scared. You've been afraid? Uh, uh, you've been scared lately? Afraid of anything recently? It seems like we live in a world that is scared right now. Fear runs rampant in our country and in our world. Nobody knows what's going to happen. People are, are scared about the economy. They're scared about their jobs. They're scared, certainly, about getting a virus. Seems like everybody is afraid. Well, listen, we take normal precautions, and that's good. You should. But we don't have to fear. And when we are afraid, we can still go ahead in the obedience that God has called us to, knowing that God is in control, and we trust Him. Gideon did just that. He goes down to the edge of the camp. Now, you may think this is a coincidence. There are no such things as coincidences. 
There is only the sovereignty of God. Gideon goes down to the edge of this camp. These people that look like locusts, there's so, so many people everywhere. And he happens to go to the edge of the camp where one man is describing a dream to his friends. Listen to this dream found in verse 13. When Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian and came unto a tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it that the tent lay along. So he has a dream. A dream about a big loaf of bread, a barley loaf. And it rolls through the camp of the Midianites and it bowls over a tent. Barley bread. That's an old rough, coarse bread. Wasn't much to eat. And it was tough to eat. Nobody liked it much. It was just old. It was uncultured and uncouth. A lot like Gideon. As a matter of fact, this bread is Gideon. Verse 14 says this, And his fellow answered and said, There is nothing else, this is nothing else save the sword of Gideon. So, this fellow tells about a dream he had, a barley loaf of bread that rolls through the Midianite camp and bowls over a tent. And his friend says, That is the sword of Gideon. And here's the remarkable thing. The dream came from God, and the answer was correct. The dream was a description of Gideon, and this fellow answered correctly, it's Gideon. And there's Gideon to hear all of this, all because he was obedient to God. He goes down by the edge of the camp, he listens, and he hears God answering his prayers. He shouldn't have feared. In verse 9, God had already said, I've delivered them into your hand. You hear me? What God says, God does. God cannot lie. And if He says it, He does it every single time. Jesus and His disciples got into a boat. Jesus says, let's go to the other side. There's a huge storm. All the disciples are scared. Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat. They should have known they'd be all right. Jesus had already said, we're going to the other side. You maybe know the rest of the story. Jesus, they wake him. He stands and says, peace be still, and then chastises them for their lack of faith. Friend, listen to me. What Jesus says, Jesus does. Jesus says he will save anybody that comes to him. Jesus says he will give you new, eternal life if you'll ask him. He will forgive you of your trespasses and sins. He will walk with you in this life. He will never leave you and never forsake you. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is building you a home in heaven right now if you will accept Him as your Lord and Savior. You'll have a home in heaven in the next life. You'll have Jesus walking with you in this life. Jesus never fails. This dream that Gideon heard, it was about him. But it says a lot more about God than it does about Gideon. Will you be obedient to the Lord today? It's worth it. A drink, a dream, and a deliverance. Gideon hatches a plan. He takes his 300 men. Verse 16 says, He divided the 300 men into three companies. He put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. So here's the story. Gideon tells him. He divides the 300 men. 100 here, 100 here, 100 here. And he, he surrounds the Midianite army with these groups of hundreds, each spread out. And he gives them a sword, a torch covered by a pot, and a trumpet. And Gideon says, when I blow my trumpet, I want you to do the same. Everybody blow their trumpet. Shatter that pot and let that light shine. And everybody yells, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Now, in verse 14, this friend, this fellow, the interpreter of the dream, he's already said that this is the sword of Gideon. Verse 14, this is nothing else save the sword of Gideon. But Gideon adds something a little different. 
He doesn't say this is the sword of Gideon. He says this is the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, and the Lord comes first. You see, everything that Gideon did was all because of God. And everything you and I have is because of Him too. Everything, every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. We sing songs about that here in church. There is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. The God of Gideon is the same God today. And everything we have comes from Him. Well, the men were obedient to Gideon as Gideon was obedient to the Lord. They all blow their trumpets. They shatter those pots. And all of a sudden, out of the darkness of the middle of the night, there are these trumpets blowing. There are these lights lighting up. These men are shouting, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And the armies of the Midianites and the Amalekites and everybody, they are so scared because they think they're surrounded by this huge army. You ever heard a coyote howling or yipping or whatever they do? They, not exactly a howl like a wolf, but have you ever heard them out in the night? One coyote sounds like two. Two coyotes sounds like eight. Eight coyotes sounds like 64. I'm not sure how it works, but they always sound like there are a lot more of them than there actually are. Well, that's what happens here with Gideon. It sounded and looked like there were a lot more of them than there really were. And the Bible says that Gideon had already won the battle before they had even... Uh, had to take a single sword stroke. Verse 20 says, The three companies blew the trumpets, break the pitchers, held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hand, and <clears throat> to blow with all they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And there stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. And listen what happens, verse 22. And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow. You see, Gideon started with 32,000 men. He ended with 300. But before any of those 300 had ever swung a single sword, God had already won the battle for them. As they blow their trumpets, as they shatter these pitchers, as they shout the Lord, sword of the Lord and of Gideon, as they are obedient to Gideon and ultimately to God, God sets all that army against each other. <laughs> the Midianites and the Amalekites and that great army, they start killing each other instead of Gideon and his men. Gideon wins the battle. But not in the way you would expect. Not with a huge army and a convincing victory. No, with a pitcher and a torch and a trumpet and God. That happens a lot in the Bible. You take a giant and you defeat him with a sword, or with a sling and a stone. You take a great walled city and you defeat the great walled city of Jericho by marching around it, blowing trumpets. You take all the great victories of the Bible, and a lot of those were won, not because they had a, a stronger military or because they had better strategy. They won those battles because the Lord was on their side. And He's on yours and mine, if you know Him. You know the one thing that separates us from God, that keeps God from being on our side? It's sin. And Jesus died for your sins. And if you know Jesus, God is on your side. He's on mine. Will you trust Him? Will you obey Him? Will you let God win the victory for you? And let's give, give Him the glory. Lord bless you as you tune in tonight, as you pray and as you study God's Word with me.
If there's a decision you need to make this evening, maybe you are a follower of Jesus, but there's some sin in your life and you need to confess that. Pray about that now. And then after you pray about it, reach out to me. Let me know that. We're keeping normal office hours this week. You can contact our office. Maybe you want to join our church. You can still do that in this strange time. Contact our office here at the church, 984-5206. We'll make sure that that happens. Maybe you want to be baptized. You've been saved, and you want to follow the Lord in obedience in baptism. Maybe you need to be saved. You have never trusted Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life. You've never asked Him to forgive you of your sins. You can do that tonight. I want to pray a prayer. And if you want to be saved, I want you to pray that prayer with me. I'll pray it out loud. You pray it to Jesus. The prayer goes like this. Jesus, I know I have sinned. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. I want you to forgive me of my sins. I want you to be the Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Help me to live for you. Amen. Now that prayer doesn't save you. Jesus saved you. But if you prayed that prayer to Jesus and you meant it, then Jesus has just given you new eternal life. You have a home in heaven when you die. You have Jesus in this life until that time. If you made that decision, reach out and let me know that. I want to talk with you, I want to pray with you, and I want to help you through that decision as you now walk with Jesus Christ. Let me know about the decisions you've made. Whether you're a new believer or you've been saved a thousand years now, listen, the truth is all of us are supposed to walk for Jesus Christ. Let's do that this week together. And I know it's a little different time. But I also know that Jesus is still in control. So let's trust Him and let's serve Him this week. Wherever you are, wherever you are, if you're saved, Jesus is with you. You find some way, somehow, to share Jesus with somebody this week, all right? Thank you for tuning in. God bless.